All right, I think we're live. So anybody that's tuning in, we will be starting in about two minutes. All right, welcome everyone to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association May Virtual Star Party. This is actually our second virtual star party. Uh, we did one last month in uh, April and that's being, that should be on our uh, Facebook page under videos. But tonight, this is the first one that we're using Zoom that is gonna give us a little more flexibility. Um, what we should be able to do now is to be able to share both the planetarium program and the live telescope feed. So we'll be able to show you where we're looking in the night sky and what the constellation looks like and then go over and take a look at the, the live tel um, telescope feed. Um, I, hopefully this is going out. It looks like it's going out fine on Facebook. I would encourage you to uh, ask questions on the chat. Um, interact with us. We're going to be asking some questions as well as we go through uh, this. So and so kind of interact back and forth. We should have several of our TAAA members um, helping with answering questions on the on the chat and uh, interacting with you as well. And then, you know, towards the end, if you get an opportunity to uh, give us some feedback, that would be great. Um, things that we can do better, things that uh, might work a little bit better for future ones. Because what we actually intend on trying to do is we want to try to do this on a monthly or quarterly basis um, moving forward. So, you know, we're about to enter our monsoon uh, here in Arizona, so we might have to pause until we get to uh, after monsoon. But then uh, we want to intermix some of our virtual star parties in with our in-person live ones. So when we, uh, when we do schedule one, we will post it out on Facebook. And we will also create a uh, Facebook event. So just kind of keep an eye on that. We'll try to put it in as early as possible. All right, so what I'd like to do real quick is we're gonna kind of introduce the team we have on board here, and then we're gonna jump right in. Uh, I'm Jim Knoll. I'm the star party manager for the association. Um, we do, when, we, when we're in a good year, we'll, we'll do about 225 star parties a year. That's about what we did last year. And those are for schools, youth groups, the public, nonprofits, um, local area resorts, things like that. So we're gonna keep those going throughout the year, but we wanna intermix some of these virtual ones, especially for anybody that can't make it to one of our events and, uh, and wants to, or lives in a, in a light polluted area or something like that. Also uh, on here um, that'll be helping uh, kind of manage things, we have Terry Lappin, who's our uh, Starry Messenger um, Outreach Coordinator uh, for the association and Mae Smith, who's the president of uh, TAAA. So with that in mind, what I wanna do is I wanna turn it over first to Jim O'Connor to say a few words, and then he'll turn it over to Bernie Stinger. Bernie's gonna be running the telescope tonight, and, we'll, uh, and he'll kinda, he has a picture of what the setup looks like, and he'll talk a little bit. So Jim, over to you. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we're out here in the warm desert in Tucson, kinda trying to stay away from each other and keep healthy out here. Um, the uh, purpose tonight is to introduce you to the night sky. And this is a wonderful opportunity to go see uh, what the sky can be like from a nice location compared to the city you might be in. So we're gonna try to include, uh, encourage you to get out, look up at the sky, learn a little bit about your home universe. And Bernie? Anyway, my name is Bernie Stinger. And I will be doing the, uh, the telescope control this evening uh, through my telescope, uh, which is outside of the building here from me. And I will also be doing the image capturing and uh, image uh, software manipulation. So uh, I'm not in Tucson right now. Uh, I'm actually located about 100 miles southeast of Tucson, uh, near the Chiricahua Mountains. Those of you who are, might be familiar with uh, Arizona, the Chiricahua Mountains are down in the southeast quadrant of the state. And 
this is our Chiricahua uh, Astronomy Complex, which is part of our club uh, and a, be a benefit of being a member of the club here in uh, in TAAA. The uh, uh, facility here has a number of uh, permanent telescopes as well as pads uh, where you can set up your own telescope and um, enjoy the, the, uh, the night sky. Um, and um, uh, it's really a wonderful uh, location because of its darkness. Uh, it's probably in the, the range of what's called Bortel 1.5 or Bortel 2. Now that may not mean anything to you, but that means extremely, extremely dark. And on a really dark night, uh, the sky is just lit up with stars. So um, let me uh, give you an idea of the telescope set up. So this is my telescope uh, that's set up about 50 feet from me outside uh, on the patio or deck area uh, just outside of the building. Now, obviously it's uh, not daylight. Now, this was taken about two and a half hours ago uh, while I was setting up. And you'll, uh, you'll notice uh, the telescope itself is called a C8. It's a Celestron uh, eight inch uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope, um, but on, in the front of the, the telescope is a special lens. It's called a hyperstar lens. And that hyperstar lens allows you to do a very fast image capture uh, over a very wide field of view. Uh, and then in front of that is what's called a, a, a deep sky uh, imaging camera. Uh, designed specifically for astrophotography, and it's made by Mallencam. Uh, it's called a DS10C with a thermoelectric cooler built into it. So those wires you see coming down uh, actually run back over to uh, an Ethernet hub and then through this cable all the way back into the control room where I'm located. So I can control uh, the mount, the motorized mount, tell it where to go and lock it onto an object uh, remotely uh, from uh, the comfort of the, what we call our warm room. Don't need not necessarily a warm room right now. It's uh, quite warm outside as it is, but it allows you to have darkness out there. Uh, here's an image that I took about 45 minutes ago. You can see it's starting to get dark out there. Um, and it's quite dark now. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to move to our first object for the evening. And All right. here it is. That up. And I'm going to let Jim talk about that. All right, so hopefully you guys are all uh, seeing this beautiful image. What I'd like for you to do is take your best guess shot at what you think this is. Um, you can type it into the chat and give us some ideas of what you're, uh, what you're thinking about. And while you're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about our little local area right around here called the solar system. So, you know, we've got the sun that's in the center and the sun accounts for 99.8% of all the matter in our solar system. The other 0.2%, um, 0.1 of that is Jupiter. And the other point one is everything else in the solar system. So the sun is huge. You can put a million Earths inside the sphere of the sun. If you want to take a guess at how long it takes light to get from the sun to your eyeballs at the speed of light, go ahead and type that in as well. One of the things we say when we're doing astronomy is that you're a time traveler. We're actually looking back in time, but depending upon how far away things are. So the solar system is kind of split up between inner planets and outer planets. The four inner planets start with Mercury. Mercury is about 29 million miles from the sun and it's fairly dead. Um, as far as we know, there's uh, not any life on it. Um, and it's extremely hot. It's probably 800 degrees or so. And it doesn't have any moons. The next one out is Venus. Venus is about 67 million miles on, on average from the sun. 
It's enshrouded in clouds and has what's called a greenhouse effect. So what happens is the light from the sun penetrates the clouds and then it gets trapped between the clouds and the planet and it just gets hotter and hotter. And so what happens here is that um, that really causes Venus to heat up. So Venus is actually hotter than Mercury. It's about 865 degrees on the surface of Venus. Hot enough to melt lead, so not a place we wanna be. Third planet out is Earth. We know how good Earth is. We're 93 million miles from the sun. Great place for life. We have an extraordinary moon. It's, uh, it's the fifth largest moon in the solar system, but it's the largest moon as compared to the planet in the solar system. So our moon is one quarter the size of Earth, whereas the largest planet or largest moon in the solar system that belongs to uh, Jupiter is tiny compared to Jupiter. Uh, and then the, the fourth planet out of the inner planets is Mars. Mars' is average is about 142 million miles from the sun. Probably had water in an atmosphere early on in its life. It has two moons. Um, and for any young adults and kids um, watching, there's a pretty good chance that in your lifetime, we will have the opportunity to travel to or live on the moon and Mars. So that would be really, really cool. And then we have the four outer planets. So uh, the fifth planet out is Jupiter. Jupiter's the largest planet in our solar system. Um, it, it, it averages about 500 million miles from the sun. You can put 1300 Earths inside the sphere of Jupiter. And Jupiter's got 79 moons. And then the next one out is Saturn. The Saturn is about 900 million miles, so almost a billion miles from the sun. Saturn's pretty good size too. You can put 700 Earths inside the sphere of Saturn. And Saturn actually has more moons than, now has more moons than Jupiter. It's got 81 moons. Saturn is known, as most of you know, for the gorgeous rings going around the planet made out of ice and rock. If you ever get an opportunity to look at Saturn or Jupiter in the night sky through a telescope, take it because they are absolutely beautiful in telescopes. And then the last two planets out there are Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is uh, almost 2 billion miles away and Neptune is about 3 billion miles away. And they average, you know, you could probably put about 60 to 65 Earths inside of each one of those planets. So they're pretty good size in their own right. Beyond Neptune is Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Kuiper Belt has uh, a lot of asteroids and what we call short period comets. So those are some of the icy comets that uh, don't take too long to come in and go around the uh, the sun. And then beyond the Kuiper belt is what's called the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is where some of the long period comets, those that can take a thousand years or longer to come in and, and go around the sun. And that Oort cloud actually, and that's where a lot of the primarily the icy comets left over from the formation of the solar system reside. And it extends almost halfway to the next star system, which the closest star system to us is the Alpha Centauri system, about 4.2 light years away. Um, so that's kind of our local neighborhood. Now let's come back into the inner solar system and let's look at this object again. Um, some of you may have thought this was the moon. Sometimes, most of the time when you look at the moon, you can see some pretty clear craters and maria and seas and things like that. But um, like I said, uh, Mercury, Venus, and the Moon all go through phases, so it just kind of depends on where they are in their orbit and where we are, so we see the, the phases like that. And it looks like most of you probably guessed v Venus on the chat, so that's, uh, that's great. Okay, so Bernie, I'm going to grab the screen from you, and we're going to, so this is looking towards the west. You'll see Venus is pretty low on the horizon. This is, uh, this is actual time. And it's very close to uh, the knee of Auriga, which is the charioteer. Um, and that's the constellation you see right around here. So there's Venus right here. And Gemini of the twins is to its upper left. So Venus right now is in that particular spot. Now what Bernie's in the process of moving the telescope to is an open cluster called M35. M35 is uh, right at the toes of uh, one of Gemini the twins, and that's also in the West. Um, so, and just uh, if you tuned in last month, we talked a little bit about Messier. 
But um, Charles Messier was a French astronomer back in the mid 1700s to early 1800s. And he was a comet hunter. And so he kept looking for, for comets. But his optics weren't all that great as they were back, weren't back in that time. And so he kept coming across these fuzzy objects. And these fuzzy objects were, uh, he didn't want to confuse them with um, comets down the road. So he started cataloging them. Well, they're just fuzzy to him, but now it turns out they're some of the best objects for amateurs to view. And so one of these, this is M35, so this is the number 35 in his list. And it's, uh, it's an open cluster about 3,000 light years away. It's a plus three magnitude, so it's, uh, it's visible with the uh, naked eye. Generally around a dark sky, if you've got a fairly decent sky, you can see just with your eyes, you can see up to a, a plus six magnitude. So in astronomy, the higher the numbers, the dimmer the object. So anything above a plus six, like seven, eight, or nine, is not going to be naked eye visible. You're going to need binoculars or a telescope. Anything below six would be. So this is a plus three, so this is naked eye, certainly within binoculars if you've got good skies as well. Um, so Bernie, why don't you grab the screen and show them what the telescope looks like. Yeah, just got there. Okay, so this is um, M35. Uh, almost all these stars that you're seeing are foreground stars, stars in our Milky Way. But this concentration of star that you see right here in the middle, or to just right of the middle, is M35. Um, M35, let me zoom in on that a little bit. We'll make it make it look a little better. There we go. Uh, M35 is um, approximately 500 stars. Um, now you can't see all of them here. You'd have to use very long exposure to pull out all those 500 stars. But um, I'm sure there's a good 40, 50, maybe 60 of them visible in this image. Uh, without going any deeper. Uh, the, the length of it is about 25 light years. So we're looking at a span of uh, the distance of 25 light years across. And there's approximately, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, star cluster is about 100 million years old. So that sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of age, but really it isn't that old of a star cluster. It's uh, not a, it's older than the one we looked at last month, uh, M45, but um, it's it's certainly not an old old cluster. Now, uh, if you've uh, noticed, just above it, it looks like a little grouping of stars as well. And it is. Uh, that is actually another open cluster. Uh, it's called NGC 2158. And uh, it's another open cluster, but it's much, much further away. And I think we're going to let Jim uh, O'Connor uh, give us a little background on that. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, um, one thing that's really interesting about open clusters is they're the remains of a stellar nursery. O open clusters uh, tend to be pretty young uh, in astronomical terms because they form and they rotate. And as they're rotating, they sort of drift apart and disperse. But the original cluster we looked at, M35, has got enough stars close enough together that it's held together for about 100 million years. But that little blur, to the upper left of it that Bernie was pointing out, NGC 2158, is over 2 billion years old. And it's, but it's four, it's four times as the distance of M35 from us. Now, we tend to measure distance in big numbers, but we make them small. Uh, as Bernie said, that was 25 light years across. Well, a light year, if you, if this may be a diff, uh, an easy way to think about it. It may just be more confusing, but a light year is about six trillion miles. 
So if you want to find out how much gas you'll have to have to drive out there, you've got to really worry about how far away it is. But that uh, cluster that Bernie's got nearly above the center, 2158, was thought until about a decade ago to be a different kind of cluster we'll talk about later. And it wasn't until they looked at the ages of the stars they realized that, realized that it was still younger than the older type of clusters. So we're kind of lucky. M35 has held itself together for about 100 million years. And um, it's sitting there, uh, oh, just uh, uh, 3,000 light years away. And that 3,000 light years, multiply that times 6 trillion, but we won't wait for you to catch up. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Jim. That's a good, uh, good description of that. So while Bernie's moving the telescope, we are going to look at the Leo triplet. So these are three galaxies in, at, near the hind quarters of Leo. So here's Leo the lion. If you were to look up in the night sky, um, it's pretty close to straight up. Here's the zenith is straight up. So it's uh, looking a little bit towards the south right now, southwest. Um, but if you look straight up, you see what looks like a backwards question mark. And that's the mane of uh, the lion. And then the hindquarters comes off to the side. The nebula is over here at his tail. And right in here is where we're going to be looking. Virgo is off to his left. And so as we move in a little bit more, what we see is we've got three galaxies, M65, M66, and NGC 3628. Um, you'll see when, when Bernie shows you the three galaxies that they're going to look a little bit warped because these three galaxies are actually interacting with each other. Um, they're about 35 to 40 million light years away. So if you think about that, when we look at what the telescope is seeing, when we, when we look at uh, what he's seeing, we're actually looking at the light that left that galaxy 40 million years ago, or about two thirds of the time back towards the dinosaurs. So that light has been traveling for a long time. So we are looking back in time, 35 million years of what the galaxy looked like back then. Now in cosmic time, that's still a blink in, in the bucket. It's not, uh, it's not very um, critical. But for us, it's a very long time. These galaxies are about a magnitude plus nine. So you can't see them with your naked eye. You need a telescope or or some binoculars, and they're probably, yeah, they're probably at the edge of binoculars. You might see a little fuzziness there. They're just slightly smaller than our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, they're about 75 to 80,000 light years across. Our Milky Way is uh, about 100,000 light years across. So they're just slightly smaller. Um, the smaller one, NGC 3628, uh, when we look at that, is going to look a little edge on. So when, uh, when when it gets there, if you look at the bottom one, that's the NGC 3628. And you can see that it looks like it's edge it's on the edge. And then the M64 and 65 are above. All right, so let's see. Um, these uh, escaped discovery from uh, Messier. So they were discovered uh, by William Herschel back in 1764. And actually, there's a supposedly a long tidal tail of about 300,000 um, light years long, kind of extending between and the NGC and the and Messier. I don't know if Bernie can pull those out or not. Um, but Bernie, do you want to add in anything uh, to these guys? Yeah, I'm uh, just fin finalizing the tweak here. Um, you should be able to see it now. So here we have. Um, uh, 65 and 66, M M65 and 66, and down below here uh, is the uh, the NGC galaxy. What I like about the uh, the NGC galaxy is not only is it edgewise, uh, but it has a beautiful dust tail that goes or dust. Uh, lane that goes right through it. So you can see the, the dust lane cutting across. You can see the central core. You can, you can kind of imagine where the spiral arms are spiraling out to this far. And then the other kind of interesting thing is 
it almost looks like the dust lanes flare on the ends. It almost looks like a little bit of a flaring uh, on both sides. And I'm not sure what exactly causes that, but uh, it's an in interesting uh, visual concept. Uh, the other two are, are very nice spirals. Uh, this one is a, uh, a, a partial barred spiral. And you can see there's numerous um, what's called uh, H2 regions. H2 regions are areas in the galaxy that um, are very active star forming areas. So they stand out as bright clumps in the arms. And you'll notice a number of them here, 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 down in this area. And also over on the other Messier galaxy uh, here and a few in this area as well. So it makes a very, uh, very beautiful uh, image of three galaxies. Um, and Leo is straight up right now, so it's very easy to spot. And I think these are almost bright enough, at least the, the Messier objects are, that you could see them um, with a pair of good binoculars. Yeah, they'll probably look just like little fuzzy, uh, kind of little fuzzy spots when you're looking at them with binoculars. The tricky part with using binoculars is trying to hold them steady enough. So if you have a way to mount them on a tripod or some other method, or if you have like a reclining chair where you can lean back a little bit and, and use your elbows to help steady it, then you're able to find stuff. Um, most everybody nowadays has good astronomy apps on their phones, so it helps you to find stuff like this. Um, and like I said, if you, if you look at the magnitudes, anything from um, probably up to maybe an, an eight or nine, nine is probably, you know, that's what these Messiers are, are probably getting, nine to 10 is probably about the limit of binoculars unless you can really hold them steady. By the way, I don't know if we, we really made it clear to the, our audience, but these are live images that are being real-time captured uh, by my system. Uh, so you're seeing them uh, as they're coming down from, from out of the universe or down in, deep in the universe. Yeah, and I think Bernie mentioned it at the very beginning, but he's out at our Chiricahua Astronomy Complex. So that's, one of, that's our, the dark site that the club owns. And so we have the opportunity as members to be able to go out there and view uh, objects and set up telescopes. We have electricity and several telescopes out there, plus pads. You can set up your own personal telescopes to be able to do some uh, dark sky observing out there. All right, anything else on that one, guys? No, I think we can move on. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and uh, if you wanna jump over to uh, the Macarians chain, we'll talk a little bit about that. All right. And that's just a short little hop from the hindquarters of Leo over to a Macarians chain. So this is, uh, here we're gonna be looking at a lot of galaxies. So here's, here's Virgo and there's a Virgo cluster. So, you know, we have a local group of galaxies around us that the three large galaxies are Andromeda, the Milky Way, and then a smaller one called uh, Triangulum Galaxy, um, which is closer to Andromeda than it is to us, are the three big galaxies in our little local group. And each one of us has, you know, 15 to 20 small satellite galaxies around our, ga our big galaxy. Um, so like Milky Way, I think has about 15. If you're ever in the Southern hemisphere and you see the large or small Magellanic clouds, those are small galaxies that are associated with the Milky Way. And we're all, our little local group is, gravity is kind of attracting us together. So we're getting a little bit closer together. Um, but we belong to um, another cluster and another, the, and galaxies kind of cluster together, but we belong to the Virgo super cluster. And these are the galaxies that we're gonna look at here. And as I zoom in, and I'll just kind of do it slowly, you'll start seeing just tons of tons of galaxy descriptions popping in as we look at it. all those the ngc numbers and all that stuff you're seeing on the screen are galaxies and so you can hardly point your telescope this way without seeing lots and lots of galaxies and so as we get zoomed in here we're going to see 
um, a chain of galaxies, and this is called Makarian's chain. So there's one, there's one. You can see uh, the eyes galaxies are two together, and they kind of curve up this way, and this is called Makarian's chain. And then if any of you uh, remember um, a while back, of uh, uh, the picture that the Event Horizon Telescope took of the supermassive black hole in the center of the constellation or of the uh, galaxy of M87. Um, that's this guy, uh, right? I think that's that guy. I think that's M87. Um, and that is right in the, uh, that's off to the south of, uh, of the Macarians chain. But the Event Horizon Telescope is nine telescopes that are scattered throughout the, and they merge them together. They kind of uh, they all kind of work together and the telescope aperture basically is like the size of the earth and so they use that to to take pictures of the supermassive black hole in the center of m87 um, our supermassive black hole in the center of our milky way galaxy is about four million times the sun the one in the center of the andromeda galaxy is about a hundred million times the mass of the sun and then the one in the center of M87 is six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. So it's a huge supermassive black hole. Bernie, you can grab the screen whenever you're ready. Yeah, just about there. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, if you, and they actually took a picture of the gas circuit going around the supermassive black hole. So it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, these galaxies, uh, you know, M84 and M86 are about a magnitude 9 to 10, so they're about the same as, as what they were um, in the Leo triplet. The, uh, they're about the eyes galaxies, when you look at them, uh, and Bernie can kind of circle them, they're about 100,000 uh, light years apart, so they're fairly close together. Um, Bernie, you want to add in anything here? Sure. Um, so this is the chain, and they, they call it a chain because it, it actually looks like a chain of galaxies that, that kind of curve up this way and uh, uh, continue on. So it's, it's kind of a, a loop of a number of galaxies all in a row, which is an unusual thing in, in the night sky. You don't typically see them kind of lined up like this galaxies tend to be scattered around, uh, but um, this grouping, and I don't, it doesn't have any natural reason for it. I think it was just pure luck from our vantage point, but this grouping of, uh, of stars uh, is really a, an attractive thing to image or look at for that matter uh, in the sky. Oh, we've got a satellite coming through. You might see it as a little streak in the upper right corner there. Um, so these are, some of these are Messier galaxies. Um, the, uh, we have M80, uh, M84 uh, and M86. Uh, these are the eyes. Uh, these are NGC galaxies as well as this one and this one. Uh, but if we zoom in on them, you can see the um, why they call the eyes the eyes because they look like two little slits like two eyeballs uh, if there was a, a nose and a mouth down here it'd be even better but uh, that but unfortunately isn't there uh, but that's why they call it the eyes and you'll notice also on either side of, of, uh, of uh, m86 here there's uh, edge on galaxies so we can zoom in on those. Here's an edge on on that side. Uh, another uh, edge on over here. Uh, here's another sp spiral galaxy. Here's another one, very little faint one, but it's there. Here's another one. Um, if you spent the time analyzing this image, here's another one. You'd probably count well over 40 galaxies in this image. Some of them large, some of them small, some of them edge on, 
some of them no more than little smudges. But the, uh, wherever you zoom in this image, you see galaxies. And I can zoom in on the, down on the bottom here and look, here's more of them. They're everywhere. Um, everything that is not a point of light, this one, that one, that one, here's another one, another one. The, the whole image is just jammed full of galaxies. And of course, those galaxies are billions and billions of stars, each one of them um, kind of a mini universe on its own. Uh, over on the far uh, or lo lower left here, I Jim, did you talk about M87? Yeah, just a little bit on the event horizon and taking the picture of the supermassive black hole, but not that much about the galaxy itself. Okay. Um, the M87 has uh, uh, a, a supermassive black hole in it, of course. There's also a jet of, of uh, highly accelerated um, uh, neutrons and uh, different uh, um, high energy particles that are streaming out of the uh, the center core. Some evenings you can see it. Uh, I don't see it this evening, but it's it's a little jet that kind of sticks out one side. Uh, but I don't it. see it there. That, don't see it there this evening. Uh, this is one of one of the, my favorite objects to, to uh, image, um, but it requires a very wide field of view. This, this field is probably close to uh, three or two or three degrees. So uh, this is a, uh, it makes a full use of the hyperstar lens that I told you about earlier. Uh, Jim? All right. Um, hey, Jim O'Connor, you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, Bernie, maybe you didn't see it on yours, but when you blew up M87, it did have the jet coming out the bottom. Oh, you did see it. Okay. There was, there was the stream of the spot. particles. Excellent. So, yeah, as Bernie was uh, talking about there, that is just, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of galaxies. Um, if you've ever looked at Hubble's uh, deep sky, um, ultra deep pictures that, they, that it took, um, it was probably looking at just a blank, you know, if you zoom in on one of these sections where there was no galaxies or anything, and then it imaged for days and days, I think, and it and that blank spot turned into thousands of galaxies. So everywhere you look, um, there's galaxies. We just can't always, always see them. So anyway, that's kind of, the, they this Macarian's chain and this supercluster uh, belongs to we belong to this cluster and so it's it's far away but relatively close in astronomical terms you know 60 to 65 million light years away is uh is relatively close in our little local group um the the galaxy the um the universe is about 13.8 billion years old so you know we can we can see a lot further than 100 million years in, in galaxies and whatnot. So, you know, that's why a lot of times you'll see large telescopes, you know, they'll be up on mountains or you'll, we'll have space-based telescopes um, so that you're able to get steady enough seeing and be able to take uh, the pictures of, uh, of these kinds of objects and, and really, really focus in on them. Well, while Bernie and Jim are working this out, I'd just like to give you a homework assignment. Look up the term cosmic web and you'll find out why those galaxies are all lined up like that. There's a reason the galaxies are in strips and groups like that. Yeah, but from our vantage point, we were just fortunate to have this orientation. Yep. Anytime you're in the middle of them, it looks great. Okay, so I'm going to start moving over uh, to the next object and uh, you'll get to see uh, how that works. Okay, here, uh, what you're seeing is the, the scope actually moving over uh, to our next object. So you'll see a lot of streaks in the image 
Those are stars that are flying by the camera's field of view. And uh, as the, uh, the scope zeroes on, uh, our next object, which is M13, and M13 is a globular cluster, and uh, the scope found M13, and there it is. So uh, once the scope finds it, then um, to uh, tweak it in and make it look a little more presentable, we uh, play with the imaging a little bit, bring the exposure down a little more so we don't wash out the centered core so badly. It is a very bright object, so that tends to be hard to do, but, uh, and now I'm going to go to the histogram and I'm going to um, take out the black level, make it darker, and then we can zoom in on it and uh, let's see, something's not quite right yet. Let's see what we need to do here. I think we need to uh, adjust the white balance just a hair. That's looking better. And maybe we'll cut down on the, um, the brightness just a little bit more. Okay, now you can kind of see those almost looks like little octopus arms that jut out from M13. So M13 is a, is a globular cluster, like Bernie was saying. Um, it's about 25,000 light years away. It's about 145 light years across. So there's probably several hundred thousand stars in that little cluster. Uh, it is a naked eye. It's like I said, it's below uh, plus six. Um, And if you were, you know, if you were to think about it, if you were on a planet around one of those stars, I mean, you'd have thousands of stars in the night sky. It would just be lit up tremendously. Um, but these are some of the older stars in our Milky Way galaxy. They're about 12 billion years old. I always uh, enjoy thinking about what it would be like to live on a planet going around one of those stars inside that globular cluster because those those stars are so close together, uh, far, far closer than stars around where we are. So they probably never have nighttime. It's probably eternal day. Uh, even in, in their night, there'd be so many blazing stars that I can't imagine that there'd be much of any nighttime whatsoever. So it's hard to believe that there could be perhaps life uh, in such a, uh, an environment of constant sunlight, but it's, it's possible. Um, I don't think they rule out anything. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other, uh, uh, thing to remember on of most of these globular clusters, they're very, very, very old. Uh, most of them are in the billions of years, which means that their suns are much older than our sun, uh, which means that any life that may have evolved uh, on a planet around one of these stars has probably evolved past our evolutionary stage. So if we ever wanted to find um, life that was evolved beyond us, this would be a place to look. Yeah, they've been around for a long time. Um, this one uh, looks pretty good in binoculars too, but uh, if you can get some, a nice clear night uh, and zoom in on a telescope, um, they don't call it the great Hercules cluster for nothing.
is right here. So this is looking kind of to the northeast, mostly east. And you're going to see uh, the constellation of uh, Hercules. You'll see um, kind of the keystone is what we call it. This is uh, looks like a little uh, um, polygon kind of thing. And then uh, on the line or the edge that is in when it's facing east, it's above it. But um, as it, it's the western edge, so as it goes across the zenith and to the west, it'll be the one that'll be below it. But about one third of the way along that line is where the Hercules cluster is. And you can kind of see uh, this is the Hercules is kind of laying on his, on his side. He's got some, uh, some snake action going on and uh, he's a complicated uh, creature. So what we're going to try to do now, and this one is a tough one for uh, Northern Hemisphere folks um, to do, but we're going to see if we can get a view of Omega Centauri. So that is NGC 5139. So. Woohoo, there it is. As you can see, so now we're looking to the south and it is not very high on the horizon. It's probably only seven or eight degrees up. This is, uh, this is Centaurus. Uh, um, that's really, this is really more of a southern sky object, but there's a couple of months in the May-June timeframe that from the southern latitudes, you're able to be able to see um, the, the Omega Centauri. And so Omega Centauri is, uh, it, it, they think it might be, you know, that they, they call it a globular cluster, but it could actually be the remnants of a small galaxy that the Milky Way captured a long time ago. There's probably several, <clears throat> several million stars in this cluster. Um, it's, uh, like I said, it's pretty low on the horizon, um, about, you know, probably about 16,000 light years away and only about 200 light years across. So, I mean, that's a million stars in the span of 200 light years. Now, remember earlier I said that we are, uh, our nearest star to um, the sun is Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away. Well, this thing's only 200 light years across and it's got a million stars in it. So, I mean, it's just you would have stars everywhere. It'd probably be like daytime. Um, and they're, they're, you know, pretty old stars. This is like a globular. It's uh, some of the earlier stars that if it is a captured galaxy, then it's some of the earlier stars that were formed in that galaxy when the Milky Way grabbed it. Um, and so there are some of the, the older stars in our, in our galaxy. Some people, they kind of think that there's probably a black hole in the center of Omega Centauri. So that would mean, you know, that would kind of lend a little credence that maybe this is a galaxy that was captured by the Milky Way back in the day and it had a black hole associated with it. Um, but go ahead. So you, can, uh, you can tell um, in comparison to M13, which is also a globular cluster we just previously looked at, this one is much, much larger. Um, not only a lot more stars, but physically far larger in size. In fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the largest globular in the Milky Way. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's the largest one and, and the brightest one as well. Right now, this is only about six degrees above the horizon. So even as far south as we are, uh, just, just about 20 miles, or as far as I am uh, right now, about 20 miles uh, north of the Mexican border, uh, it's still just, just above the horizon uh, in the deep south. Right? But this is the best time of year to catch this. It's only visible for, for a couple of months uh, during uh, the, uh, uh, this time of year, and um, this is the, the perfect time to capture it. Jim, you want to jump in with any uh, additional stuff on? Uh, on yeah, Omega's? yeah. Um, we've, earlier we saw an open cluster, and I talked about the, um, 
uh, I talked about the rotation of them. In general, most of the time causes the stars to disperse. Lobular clusters are at the other end of the lifespan. That's a stellar retirement home. That's all stars that are almost as old as the beginning of the universe in some cases. Uh, certainly around 12, 11 and a half to 12 billion years old in general. The core stars are the uh, main body stars of the Milky Way are about seven and a half billion years uh, old or so, but it's got 154 or so of these kinds of objects circling it. These globs that are uh, over 12 billion years old. So they were here five billion years before the Milky Way formed and now they're circling the Milky Way. A lot of conjecture on where they came from. Uh, they have found in a couple of research sites uh, intermediate mass black holes at the core of a few of them, which leads them to believe, as Jim said, that some of these are uh, subsumed galaxy cores, that when the Milky Way started to form, it had a higher total uh, gravity pull, and it got the gas out of them. And, uh, but, the, but the density of them, the stars are so close together, it's like a beehive in there, they're really they're really moving very fast on the inside of that uh, object, yet the gravity, the mass of them holds them together and keeps them together. But since they're 12 billion years or so old, 11 to maybe almost 13 billion years old, um, generally these are moderately sized stars or small stars. The big ones have already gone supernova. So what you've got in there is stars about the size of our sun that have already gone to the end of their existence and left behind white dwarfs a lot of times. So you've got medium-sized stars and white dwarfs spinning around in there. And it's such a busy uh, uh, a traffic jam in there that occasionally a couple of the white dwarfs will hit each other or a star and a white dwarf will collide or two of the stars will collide. And that makes up a, a special star that was a puzzlement until uh, relatively recently called blue stragglers. And what it happens is it forms a new star and its age looks like it's only a couple of hundred million years old. So it doesn't look like it fits. So there's a lot of activity going on there. And if you adjust, if you have a type of camera that can, you can adjust the intensity and the color balance on it, you can actually see um, red giants on the inside from stars that are reaching the end of their life in there. So um, their mass, that means how much of them there is and the closeness of them holds them together. By the way, uh, the term glob is a highly technical, uh, advanced <laughs> uh, astronomical term. Um, so we should, we should mention that, right, Jeff? Yes, yes, exactly. So we're gonna stay on Bernie's screen on this one again, and uh, as he moves right next door to uh, uh, Centaurus A galaxy, so you can kind of see how he moves and, uh, and tweaks the next one. All right, let me get uh, get set up here for that. And while he's starting to uh, get the telescope go going, so this uh, next one is called uh, Centaurus A galaxy, and it's uh, about a magnitude plus seven, so it's just outside of naked eye. Um, and it's only about 12 degrees high, so it's only another four or five degrees higher than Omega Centauri. Okay, dead center. I like that. Let's uh, let's bring up our exposure a little bit. It looks a little on the weak side. So Bernie, when you get a chance, somebody was asking on chat about what camera and, the, and if you want to say a little bit about the Hyperstar while you're moving. Right. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, but perhaps you, you probably didn't catch it, uh, I'm using a Mellencam uh, DS-10C. Uh, the DS-10C means a deep sky, 10 megapixel, uh, and C is for color. So it's a color 10 megapixel astro, uh, or astronomical 
uh, deep sky camera. So it's extremely sensitive to, to uh, light. Uh, we call them photon counters uh, because that's how sensitive they are. Uh, this one has a thermoelectric cooler on it uh, to, uh, uh, to keep it cool and keep the noise level down, uh, which is also uh, helps improve the image quality. And uh, I'm also using, uh, along with it, a special lens uh, called a Hyperstar lens. And that lens uh, allows me to take images of uh, very large objects in the sky. It, it allows me to cover uh, about two and a half to uh, a three degree field, uh, which is far larger uh, than the typical field that most uh, schmidt cassegrains um, uh, or refractors which cover, which are usually one degree or less. So I'm, I'm looking at a much larger area of the sky. Uh, the system is a lot faster because of it, uh, and that keeps the, uh, the imaging time down. Uh, just out of, just to, uh, to show you the image I'm, I'm show presenting right now, uh, I'm taking in 3.9 seconds. So this is a, an image of 3.9 seconds. Uh, to uh, to capture this image, uh, and there it is. This is uh, the uh, what's called Centaurus A. Um, Jim, were you going to talk about that at all, or yeah, yeah let's talk about that one. Yeah, let Jim O'Connor talk a little bit about it. Okay, this one has a dust lane in the middle, and the. Uh, that it leads it to have a name called the Hamburger Galaxy. And the reason it's got the dust lane is it used to be, uh, or it was recently a collision between a small spiral galaxy and a, very, and a pretty large elliptical galaxy. And as a result, the small spiral had a lot of empty ga uh, extra gas left over. And when it hit that elliptical galaxy, it, started, it got compressed, started making lots of stars. It's a star, uh, star forming galaxy right now. Does, when the stars form, they put out energy, and they, uh, uh, the energy that they put out when the nuclear fusion starts has driven some of the debris out to the outer edge of this, uh, of this object. So it looks like it's got this big dust lane, but it's driven there because all these superstars are being formed right now. Yeah, and you, you look at that dust lane, I mean, it's thick compared, you know, most of the galaxies when we look at, a, especially the edge galaxies, we look at the the dust lane kind of cutting across the the thinner part of the galaxy. Um, it did look like a thin little strip. This one is is very broad, very very deep with uh, with dust. Yeah, the uh, the NGC galaxy we looked at and the Leo triplet had a thin dust lane across it. Both this object, uh, Centaurus A, and the uh, previous object, Omega Centauri. Uh, didn't have M numbers, or what we call Messier numbers. And the reason for that um, is because of how far south they are uh, on almost near the southern horizon. Um, the Messier objects were all visually located back in the late 1700s uh, by Messier and some of his cohorts uh, in Europe and they couldn't see that for ourselves. So they didn't know they existed. Uh, so they never got Messier numbers. These, these objects weren't even discovered until uh, around 1820s, in the 1820s, 1830s um, in Australia. And they were discovered by Europeans, European astronomers who took their telescopes, sailed to Australia, and then did a, a search of the night sky, the southern night sky uh, from Australia to see what new objects they could find. So most of these uh, were uh, discovered back in that time frame. So while Bernie's uh, 
move into the pinwheels. Now we're going to go north. We're going from the far south, and he's going to swing it all the way around and look up towards the North Star or Polaris. So where we're looking, if you, uh, if you look on uh, my screen here, you can see the Big Dipper. So here's the, the handle of the Big Dipper. It's upside down. And then here's the bucket. Um, the open end of the bucket is here. This is part, uh, this is an asterism uh, we call the Big Dipper. It's part of Ursa Major, which is the big bear. So it's primarily the long tail of the bear. And, uh, and like I said, he's kind of uh, upside down. Um, and that's, uh, that's, so that's the Big Dipper. And then if you, whenever you can find the Big Dipper, if you can see these two end stars, you've got the pointer stars to always find north. And so these two end stars always point right down here to Polaris. And this is Polaris down here. And this is the Little Bear or Ursa Minor. And this is the Little Dipper. Now again, it's really long tail in this bear. Um, and then you've got the bucket of the Little Dipper. Generally speaking, most people can see Polaris if you've got kind of decent skies and you can see these two end stars. Most people can't, unless you've got really good skies, you can't see much of the, the handle. Um, this little guy right here is the dimmest of, of all of them. And so if you, if, and each one of these is a different magnitude. So if you've got good dark skies, or if you can see all of the little dipper, then that means you've got good dark skies. So this is where we're looking, we're looking up north, and where we're gonna be looking is at M101, which is called the Pinwheel Galaxy. So it kind of forms a triangle off of Alcade, and this is a star called Mizar, a double multiple star system. So it kind of forms a, uh, a triangle off of that. So the Pinwheel Galaxy is about a magnitude eight. It's, uh, it's relatively close, it's about 22 million light years away, and it's a face-on spiral, so we're looking you know, most spiral, most galaxies we look at, we're looking kind of at the face. If they're spiral galaxies, we can kind of see the, the curvature and the, the spiral arms. Or we might be looking at the edge of the galaxy. Most galaxies are flat. They're kind of like a CD, and they're spread out. So if you're looking at the edge, you're going to see, you're not going to see as much of it. But all that light is going to be concentrated on a very skinny portion. So it's very bright. Whereas if you're looking at the face of the galaxy like we are here, all that light gets diffused out. And so although it looks great in pictures, in a telescope, visually, it's going to look just kind of like a little fuzzy spot. You're not going to be able to see the details of the arms. Usually so just the center core, right? Yeah, usually just the center core. If you use your inverted or peripheral vision and kind of look at the out of the side of your eyes when you're trying to look through a telescope eyepiece, then you might be able to see a little bit of the spiral uh, structures. Um, the Pinwheel Galaxy is huge though. It's uh, almost twice the size of our Milky Way galaxy. So it's 170,000 light years across. And I mean, it just looks like a pinwheel. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous um, galaxy. And, it's, and they think there's probably about a trillion stars there. Um, our Milky Way's got, you know, maybe three to 400 billion stars or thereabouts. Um, this one's got a trillion stars. So it's got probably three times the amount of stars that we have. And Bernie, if you want to highlight anything in particular. Yeah, just tweaking it here. Um, yeah, this is twice the size of, of the Milky Way. So it's a monster. And uh, uh, it's, it's still a very active galaxy. Uh, the, they know it's an active galaxy because there's, there's some very bright, what's called H2 regions. I mentioned that earlier uh, when we were looking at galaxies. Those are, those are star forming regions that are forming so many stars that they just glow um, as bright spots within the galaxy and the arms of the galaxy. So you, here's a there's a very bright one here, another one there, another couple there. Um, I mean, it's just covered with them. Uh, here's a very bright one here. I think there was another one up higher. Uh, maybe, maybe I was not. Oh. No, that that this is probably another galaxy over here. Uh, but you can see little sections of the arm, even way up in here, even. Um, so that's multiple arms and um, very, very active galaxy and star formation. I think they, 
they counted almost 200 star forming regions, hot, very active star forming regions with this, within this galaxy. Yeah, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous galaxy to look at. Just about done. We just got a couple more we want to highlight. So now we're just moving over a little bit. Uh, we're still in Ursa Major. Um, we're going back to the Big Dipper. Um, but instead of being off the, the handle over here, we're now off the uh, bucket. And we're looking at M108, um, which is a galaxy uh, in Ursa Major. And we're also going to, when Bernie gets the scope over there, you're actually also going to be able to see a, a planetary nebula called the Owl Nebula in the same uh, field. So this one's kind of cool. The, the galaxy is looks like an edge galaxy, so it's a bar spiral, but again, we're going to see the, the thinness um, edge of it. And then you'll see the contrast to M97, which is the Owl Nebula. Planetary nebulas are, they're, they're, they're not really plan, they're not associated with planets. They just, they, when they looked at them with early telescopes, they looked fuzzy and not pinpoints like stars. So they caught, thought, thought maybe they were planets or something like that. But basically what it is, is it's gas from a star that's gone through its death throes. And so in this case, uh, when we look at it, and Bernie, you can grab the screen whenever you get set up. Um, when we look at it, we can actually see the, the dust or the, the gas from what the, came off of this star um, around the, uh, the nebula. It's, uh, it's about a plus uh, 10 magnitude. So it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, little bit uh, hard to see. You, you need a telescope or a good pair of binoculars. Um, when Bernie gets the scope on it, uh, he can talk a little bit about the uh, eyes and the dark areas and things like that. It's, uh, it's about 2,000 light years away, so it's not uh, um, all that far away. And it's only the owl, oh, we're talking about the nebula here. The, uh, the nebula is only about two light years across. And it probably formed about 6,000 years ago is when, uh, when this went through, through that uh, process. So while Bernie's still tweaking the scope, uh, Jim O'Connor, you want to talk any more a little bit about M97 and 108? Yeah, the, the owl that's out there, as you were saying, it's about 6,000 years old because these things can only last about 10,000 years. Because what we don't see when we look at it is how fast those gases are moving away from the star position they used to be in. So pretty, uh, when they get about 10 to 15,000 years of travel, away from that white dwarf star, it's no longer enough energy to make it flow or get fluorescent like you can see on the screen right now. Um, the, uh, it, it's just a factor, uh, factor of at the end of its life, the gases run away and they get lit up by the uh, central white dwarf carbon and oxygen star in, in the middle. And uh, uh, it can only do it for so long. When the gas gets away, it stops flowing. Okay, I finally got there. Um, you're right, Jim, it wasn't far away in the sky, but unfortunately, it was on the other side of the meridian. Uh, <laughs> and for those people uh, watching who have a scope uh, and know what the meridian means, it means that the, it's on the other side of the sky. So my scope said, no, I can't just go there. I have to go all the way around and look at it from the other direction. Yes, we didn't uh, so think this one through what's very well. A meridian <laughs> clip. Uh, but it got there uh, finally. So here we've got a nice combination of uh, not only uh, an edge on galaxy, um, and this is another one of those uh, edge on galaxies with lots of star forming regions in it. Uh, so you can see the, the star forming clumps within it um, in a nice edge on format. Uh, but also uh, the, uh, the planetary uh, called the Owl Nebula, or yeah, the Owl. Uh, now, why is it an owl? Well, so this is the owl's face, and this is the owl's right eye, and here's the owl's left eye. They're dark, not light. Those are the two dark spots. Those are the eyes. And he's got the tiny little white dot is his nose. So that's how we, why we call it uh, the, the owl nebula. And it has a nice 
blue glow, which remind bluish green glow, which reminds me of of uh, uh, something dark at night. At least that's how I see it. Uh, it makes a really nice pair. And uh, the other thing to remember here is the owl is close by. It's within our galaxy. It's it's a it's a neighbor, whereas this galaxy is far far away. Uh, so the I don't know what the the difference in distance between these two would be, but I would I would have to venture a guess of millions to one. <laughs> 2,000 light years versus 45 million light years. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes the night sky can be deceiving when you're looking at it. You don't think of the three-dimensional aspect of it. It looks more two-dimensional. And, and this, this gives a, a good example of how perplexed astronomers were for hundreds of years because they'd look at objects like this with, when, in the early days of telescopes and they couldn't figure out distance. They had no idea how far away are these things. Um, and if you just go by size, looking at these two, you'd think, well, they're about the same size. They're probably about the same distance. But lo and behold, that's not the case. Glad your mount keeps the cords from getting wrapped up, Bernie, and switches meridian sides. Well, I do a lot of cord dressing uh, beforehand <laughs> to make sure that doesn't happen. Because there's nothing worse than having your cord snag on you when you're 50 feet away and you, you hear the motors groaning and you know you're not going to be able to run there quick enough. Okay, so uh, we're just about there. Do a white balance. Darken the sky up a little bit, make it a little more easy to see. And then I'm going to a little average stacking to clean up the image. Okay, so the object you see in front of you or on the screen right now, um, this is Messier 61. It's a spiral, a barred spiral galaxy in the Virgo supercluster that Jim was talking about a little while ago. Um, it's about 53 million light years away, uh, but it's not the, uh, uh, it's not the, galaxy that is the surprise here. Uh, the surprise is that this little white dot that my mouse is circling right now is not a star. Well, it's not a star in our galaxy. These stars that you see sprinkled around in the screen here are foreground stars in our galaxy. This star, this star, this star, all of these points of light are stars that you see in our galaxy. To see outside of our galaxy, you have to peer through our stars. But this star is not a star in our galaxy. That star is actually a star in this galaxy. And why is that star so obvious? Why is it we can see a star in another galaxy? And that's because that is a supernova. That is an active supernova. Uh, it was just discovered about 10 days ago. Um, and um, it's 
actually uh, 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 let's see um, it's a type 2 supernova this type of supernova is one that happens when a star reaches the end of its lifetime and if that star has a mass of between 8 and 40 times the mass of our sun, in other words, it's got to be 8 times to 40 times bigger than our sun, then when that star reaches the end of its lifetime and it no longer has the fuel left in it to burn any longer, it collapses on itself and rebounds in a massive explosion called a supernova. Now, supernovas are extremely rare. They happen within the Milky Way galaxy probably only once every 100 years. And the last recorded one in the Milky Way, our Milky Way galaxy, I believe was uh, M1, um, which was in what, 1064, was it? Yeah, 1054. 1054. July the so 4th. You can see how rare they are. However, when you have so many galaxies out there, millions and millions of galaxies to look at, then your probability of finding one becomes a little easier. And this one, again, was discovered uh, about 10 days ago um, in the galaxy M61. And um, I thought you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, it's, given, it's been given the name SN2020JFO. Yeah, it's not every so there day. There you go, an active yeah. supernova. Can't yeah, say not... you've never seen one. No, yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, I think we probably ought to call it quits for the night. Um, hey, Jim? Or, yeah. Can you guys repeat the galaxy and um, the constellation it's in? This is M61, and it's in the constellation Virgo. If anybody wants to find it, it's at right ascension 12 hours, 21 minutes, 55 seconds, declination plus four degrees, 28 minutes, 22 seconds. So it's not, it's kind of in the same area where we were looking. Um, so here's Virgo again. And uh, it's kind of right, uh, so here's, uh, here's Macarian's chain is way up here is where Macarian's chain we were looking at. So it's down below that in the constellation of Virgo and there's the galaxy. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here and just kind of wrap things up a little bit. Um, I think, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, what we uh, did tonight. Um, we probably won't get an opportunity to do another one uh, before monsoon kicks in uh, here. So uh, it will probably be in the fall, but we'll see. We might uh, sneak one in in June if we can. But we will post on our Facebook page and we'll do a virtual uh, event that uh, of uh, when we uh, schedule one so you'll know about it. But until then, uh, definitely keep, uh, keep looking up and uh, enjoy the night skies. And if we get an opportunity to go back to doing some in-person star parties. We do, we do a lot of public star parties around Tucson. And so you can, you can always find them on our Facebook page. There's also a calendar on our, uh, on our uh, club's uh, website. It's just tucsonastronomy.org. And you can go there and get information about it. And uh, we'll, I think I've got them posted there through the end of the year, but we haven't scheduled uh, 2021 yet, but hopefully we'll be able to get back into doing some, some around town. Uh, Bernie, Jim, you guys got any final comments? Just uh, thanks for coming and uh, we enjoyed your company.
All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, hopefully, uh, Terry, if you can save this onto the Facebook and we'll, um, it'll be there. So if anybody wants to play it or if you've got family or friends that uh, want to check it out uh, after the fact, I know we have a few East Coast uh, watchers and it's probably getting kind of late over there, um, but they can, they can uh, check it out later. But anyway, um, we'll uh, try it again here very soon. Thanks everybody.